The NBA season continues on with the Sixers remaining in the playoff hunt, firmly in the conversation for one of the best teams in the Eastern Conference, and some of the other Eastern Conference foes beginning to show a couple cracks in the foundation for how the teams look. This has furthered the search for why the Sixers need the missing piece to elevate themselves to true contenders, and we have a little clarity on what they might be looking for thanks to the athletic Sam Emick. In this video, I want to talk a little bit about what his comments, how this pertains to the Sixers moving forward, and talk about what that player specifically he's referring to. So I want to kick it off with this quote here. This no breaking news here, but the Philadelphia 76ers haven't lost a step since trading James Harden to the Los Angeles Clippers earlier this season, but they're reportedly still interested in adding another star player to pair with reigning NBA MVP Joel Embiid. According to The Athletic, Sam Amick, the Sixers, quote, have been studying the star player market closely ever since James Harden's trade request in late June made it clear that he was on his way out. So that was the question at this point in time is who is this co-star to Joel Embiid? Where is the best option on the market? What player can fit this need? Now, the greatest solution to this and what has been made clear through the start of the season is they had that on their roster already in Tyrese Maxey. Now, the counter to that being that I don't think it is just Tyrese Maxey and Joel Embiid can be the two pairing to get the job done. While both have been absolutely phenomenal to start this season, and I do believe the Maxey leap is legit, there's still some more needs on this overall roster from the Sixers. And Sam Mamick dove further into this to discuss on what the player that they could be looking for is. So I'll bring that quote up here. And what was written was, quote, Earlier this season, there was a belief that the Sixers were interested in trading for an offense first player like bull shooting on Zach Levine. However, Amick noted that, quote, the unexpected improvement in their post-hardened offense makes it more likely that they'll target a high-end two-way player heading into the February 8th trade deadline. The Sixers' success this season can be attributed to another MVP caliber campaign from Embiid. The big man leads the league with 34.2 points per game on 53.4% shooting and ranks fifth with 11.7 rebounds while also adding a career high 6.0 assists along with 1.9 blocks and 1.1 steals. So for starters, I will make the note how insane it is that Joel Embiid coming off an MVP season is averaging more points, more rebounds, more assists, more blocks, and more steals per game last year while playing less minutes. That just does not happen and is really super superhuman stuff but you do have to tip your cap and acknowledge it and frankly I don't think he has gotten the national praise that he has deserved for that he's been the best player in the NBA by a pretty significant margin in my mind this year yes you can make an argument for Shea Gilders Alexander Luka Doncic even Giannis but to me I don't think it's particularly close that Joel Embiid has been the best player in the MVP my stance on Joel has always been when he plays to his peak, he plays his best basketball. There is nobody on the entire planet that can play as well as his. There are more ups and downs with Joel than I would say is the case with your traditional star. For example, a bad Shea, Gil Shea Gilgis Alexander game is better than a bad Joel Embiid game. But when he is at his top end production, it doesn't get much better than that. But to speak on the Sixers as a whole, I did want to touch on that comment of the post-Harden offense. And I would begin by just proving how effective it has been. Shout out to NBA University for this graphic here. As you can see, the Sixers five-man unit of Tyrese Maxey, DeAnthony Melton, Tobias Harris, Nico Batum, and Joel Embiid is the best five-man lineup, the best net rating of any five-man lineup in the entire NBA. They're outscoring teams by 33.3 points per uh per 100 minutes i believe this is um that over the course of 467 minutes on the season and when you can kind of compare this to some of the other teams around the nba some surprises in there like the chicago bulls unexpected to see them in there and noteworthy that zach levine is not a part of that unit but only a 219 minute sample size there you can also see the suns Pretty small sample size with that as well in the 202 category. The Celtics, who you expect with their contenders, they have not seen a ton of the Chris Stapps Porzingis. He is back to his usual ways of battling injuries in this one. The Pacers and James Harden showing face with the Clippers unit there. They're finding their stride. And, of course, the Bucks. So the top five... Uh, top the starting lineup of each of the top three contenders in the East with the Sixers, Celtics, and Bucks each make an appearance on this list. But I do think it speaks to how productive the Sixers have been. That graphic right there. One of the key reasons has, of course, been Nico Batum. I've highlighted him quite a bit on this channel, but his ability to make entry passes and create easy buckets for Joel Embiid truly is a difference-making factor in this offense. But to talk about what could make that offense better, we do have to circle back to this two-way conversation. Now, the Sixers' most recent performance, I'm dropping this video shortly before they take on the Timberwolves, but their most recent performance prior to that was their loss to the Chicago Bulls. 
Now, in a vacuum, not a game that I'm worried about in the grand scheme of things. I think the Sixers had to kick off a little rust after playing a number of teams that hardly qualified to be considered in the NBA. Me speaking about the Detroit Pistons from the Washington Wizards here. So they faced a real NBA team in the Chicago Bulls who certainly have their issues and plenty of rumors, speculations, trade, all those things. But the bottom line is they are a competent team with real NBA players who can compete at a high level and prove that against the Sixers. So I'm going to pull up the box score here and take a look. And the biggest thing that jumped out to me about why this loss was a little concerning is take a look at who showed up and who didn't. For starters, Joel Embiid up to his usual usual magic, 40 points, 14 rebounds, 6 assists, had 2 blocks, shot 15 of 28 from the field, 2 of 6 from 3, got to the free throw line 9 times, then Tyrese Maxey adding 29 points of his own along with 8 assists, 5 rebounds, he shot 5 of 11 from 3, 9 of 23 from the field, but then when you look beyond that, not a single other member of the Sixers scoring more than eight points in this matchup. Paul Reed would be the next highest with eight points there. Not a good sign for the team. Now, if we want to point fingers, I've talked plenty about Tobias Harris. It is straight up unacceptable for him to score three points in 32 minutes. And beyond that, even further unacceptable to only attempt three shots in 32 minutes. This is a guy who is paid like a number three, for times being paid like a number one, to just kind of you know, just exist out there is just straight up unacceptable. The guy that I will sh shine a little light on is Kelly Oubre. Not a good Kelly Oubre game, but I will take him shooting himself through it. Shot two for 10 from the field, one for five from three, finished with six points and three rebounds. While it was not a good Kelly Oubre game, what I will compliment is he did not lose confidence. He hit a massive three late in the fourth quarter to keep it a game. One of his two made shots on the game, the other one being a pretty uh, athletic dunk that was nice to watch as well. But what I liked about Kelly's game, that even though he was missing, he was taking the right shots. He took it in stride, was confident, and that is what this Sixers team needs. They need more from the guys like DeAnthony Melton, who added just six points and five shot attempts in his 29 minutes of play. Tobias Harris certainly is a, guy, a name that should be, be circled there. But I guess the missing answer is they need to find an outside source to generate offense as well. I don't think the answer is a Zach Levine archetype of player because then the defensive issues show face. That I do believe the Sixers, as long as Joel Embiid is a part of this roster, will always be a top 15 defensive team. That he's that impactful as a rim protector. He's capable of making up for others' mistakes in a way that very few across the entire NBA can. But Joel Embiid is that level of defender. However, if you add a Zach Levine style of player to this offense who has his defensive deficiencies, and Tyrese Maxey, while I give him quite a bit of credit for improving on the defense end during his time in the NBA, there's just matchups that he's going to struggle in that due to his frame, due to his size, he's never going to be able to take one-on-one -on -one matchups against a Jason Tatum or a Jalen Brown. And when you add another guy who really can't in Zach Levine, and for Levine specifically, I don't think it's an engagement issue defensively, as was the case with James Harden, that when James Harden tries on defense, he can hang, he can be in there, but there was too often where that was not the case. For Levine, for whatever reason, I just straight up don't think he's a good defender. But I don't think it's out of lack of effort. I think he does try, but he frankly just gives up too many easy buckets and the results are not there. Now, the clean answer, and a name that I've talked about plenty on this channel, is OG Ananobi. That we still don't know the exact out outlook for the Raptors and what their game plan is for here. I'm not sure that Masai himself knows what the full game plan is for this team, but he is that prototypical 3 and D two-way player that I feel like keeps getting brought into this conversation. And I want to kick things off with his contract here. We know he's on the last year of his... Uh, a full contract here making 18.6 million he has a 19.9 million dollar player option for next season i would guess that he opts out of that regardless whether it is to re-sign with the raptors or sign a massive contract to another team that is far below his market value at this point in time that these three and d players their skill set is at such a premium that that price leaps up i mean if tobias harris is making 40 million a year og ananobi can surely catch a bag but to speak about him in the context of this Sixers team, he's absolutely a great defender. He would be the best perimeter defender on this Sixers team. The guy tasked with guarding the Jason Tatums, the Jalen Browns of the world, and really buckled up for those playoff matchups that the Sixers have to find a way to overcome. But he also can add things on the offensive side of the floor. And to look at his stats specifically, this season averaging 15 points per game, 4.1 rebounds, 2.5 assists. Seen his minutes dip a little bit. He went from 35.6 last season to 32.9. That's kind of the reason for this production drop. A little curious about what that is. Obviously, that uh, Scotty Barnes is having a very impressive season and is clearly the building block foundational piece of that Raptors organization at this point in time. 
What do you do with OG? What do you do with Pascal? It doesn't make any sense to lock into both of those two and Scotty to the long term because, frankly, you're buckling up, buckling in for the best case scenario of you being a mid playoff team for the rest of their careers. That it doesn't make sense that this Raptors team is still missing a top end star. And while they can squint and hope that Scotty Barnes becomes that guy, I frankly just don't think that's the case. And when you look at who you're surrounding him with, you have to find players that complement him, not have similar skill sets. Now, yes, Scotty Barnes and OG Ananobi are far from the same exact player. They definitely have different strengths and weaknesses in their game, but they're still in that same kind of category of player. Now, for OG, who's a much more attainable piece than Scotty Barnes in this situation, and frankly, I would prefer OG given what the Sixers need in this current team, I do think he could be that link between Joel Embiid and Tyrese Maxey, that he is still going to be a defensive first guy, but he's capable of knocking down three-pointers. He's capable of attacking a little bit off the dribble, and to speak exactly on those three-point numbers, shooting 37.6% from the field this year, shot 38.7% last year, 37.5% from his career. That is all that I need to see. If you were an upper 30s percent three-point shooter, you're going to get easy looks due to the gravity of Joel Embiid. People always shoot their career high here in Philadelphia because of Joel Embiid, because you're going to get open three-point looks. George Niang caught quite a bag just by simply maximizing on, I know guys are going to double this guy. I'm just going to catch and shoot, knock down threes. He did that at a high level and got paid to go to the Cleveland Cavaliers. I don't know if it's the same exact case with OG, but he will be left alone and open in ways that he simply is not with the Raptors, that he would be far from the most dangerous shooter on the Sixers team, but Maxi, obviously a highly elite three-point shooter, one of the truly most elite shooters in the entire NBA who does not get enough recognition for that. But to compare that to with Embiid, with Maxi, that OG being a true third option versus the Raptors, it kind of feels like they're kind of ducking for blows for who's what, who's who stands where in the pecking order. And OG, I think oftentimes is the odd man out. He's going to know his role with the Sixers team if that were to be the case. So frankly, I think it's the right move to zero in on these two-way guys because I still have concern that Jason Tatum can drop 50 on a game seven in Philadelphia again this season. Adding an OG could stop that. And when you add in the fact that he's already a better tertiary scorer than some of their current options, that you can add this to the mix, to me, it makes perfect sense. So I'm going to continue to talk about each of these. I'm going to continue to break down every report that comes out regarding the Sixers trade outlook. But I do like this little intel of them shifting towards this two-way option, this defensive-minded player or two-way player, however you want to word it. I do think it's time to look away from the Zach Levine category, both from a contract standpoint, from the fact that the Bulls are winning more games without him than they did with him. There's a lot of red flags attached to Zach Levine. I don't feel that way against OG, about OG Ananobi. But I do want to hear from you guys what you think. Make sure to drop a comment letting know your thoughts on OG Ananobi as a whole. Could he be that missing piece, that two-way player that the Sixers are in hope for? I think I'm pretty close to stamping my flag on that island that OG is my official preference. There's still plenty of season and plenty of factors to break down. But I'm feeling a little more concrete in that now that we're at over a 25 game sample size for this season once again thank you guys for watching don't forget to hit that like button drop a comment and subscribe to the channel appreciate all you guys once again i'll be talking with you next time right here on sixers digest peace